Here we go. Chapter 21. A decision, an announcement, and an unexpected arrival. It had taken a month, but Commander Malinoff felt certain, taking a test fight alone in his lab, that his candy was perfect. His masterpiece. So many false starts, he chuckled now, realizing that it had been simple in the end. The addition of a tiny portion of nougat before he poured the melted chocolate over and allowed it to harden on the small delectable bar. Now that his experimental work was complete, he would give the formula, the recipe to the worker satisfactory, and they would begin production, mixing the ingredients in his huge, in huge stainless steel vats. Thousands of bars would so- soon be popping out in orderly rows from the final machine, and then would go to the packaging department, where they would be hygienically sealed into paper wrappers with the name in bright red letters, then packed into cartons and shipped to distributors throughout the world. Soon they would appear in corner stores and movie theater refreshment cases and vending machines everywhere. He could picture them there. He could picture laughing children, indulgent grandmothers, teenagers, all of them pointing to what would soon be familiar red letters and asking for... Asking for... Ugh, he groaned. The name, he still wasn't sure. It wasn't certain what the name should be. He began, or he had begun to feel that it should not be named, referring to any ingredients or to any body mechanics. No licking or chewing or munching references. No, it needed something unusual, something sweet. As a name. He was actually thinking about naming the new candy bar after his child. Downstairs in the mansion, baby Ruth was playing, as she often did in the front hall. She had just learned to walk, still unsteady on her chubby legs. She toddled across the oriental rug, trying to catch the cats, who twitched their tails mischievously to tease her. But they were adept to leaping just out of her reach as she approached. The twins were playing a game of checkers in the parlor, and Tim was industriously putting together a model airplane out of balsa wood, being very careful not to sniff the glue. In the kitchen, Jane was helping Nanny frost some cupcakes. Commander Melanoff came down from the laboratory to announce the final perfection of the candy he had been working on for a month now. He had a proud look, thinking of his candy, and when he stood on the lowest landing of the elegant staircase, he saw his family busy with their happy enterprises. He looked, His look became fond as well. Such a short time ago, he had been grieving. Miserable and messy. And yes, he had to admit, messy. Man who thought there was nothing, or a man who thought there was nothing left to look forward to. And now there were delicious odors wafting in from the kitchen. There were five children in residence who were old-fashioned, well-behaved, clean, healthy, and bright. Twilight streamed in through the high windows, and the windows were clean and well-polished, and the floor gleamed with wax. Commander Melanoff looked around and smiled with pride and satisfaction. The only thing within his sight was that the slightly jarring, a little off-putting, a wee bit out of order, was a huge stack of crumbled and yellowed papers against the wall. It had been there so long that the cats no longer batted at it and Ruth had outgrown her interest in it now that she could walk and had other things to examine. But Commander noticed now that it briefly represented his sad past. He considered what he should do. He had cleared his throat loudly as if he was prepared to make an announcement. Everyone looked up, even the cats. Nanny emerged from the kitchen with a spatula in one hand and Jane by her side. I have made a decision, Commander Melanoff announced. You've chosen a name for the candy, asked him. The commander shook his head. Oh, that, yes, I I think so, but not the topic of my decision. Barnaby A. surreptitiously made his move on the checkerboard, took one of his brother's men, and kinged himself. Dinner's almost ready. er, We're having chicken, Nanny pointed out, not to rush you. I'll be brief, the commander replied. Gather round, everyone. Nanny, baby Ruth, Willoughby's, Tim, A, B, and Jane. He had become accustomed to the names A and B, but he thought again, as he often had, there was something puzzlingly familiar about the name Willoughby. 
He smiled at all of them from the stairs when they had gathered curiously to hear his announcement. This house, he began, has changed greatly in the past months, all because of you, each one of you. Baby Ruth, of course, who appeared so mysteriously and soothed my grief. The toddler recognized her name, grinning and giggled. One day, quite soon, a fabulous candy baller will be named for her. Tim, the commander looked at the boy fondly. What can I say about an old-fashioned lad? Of course, we will all lament the regrettable and mysterious loss of your parents. But in the true spirit of orphanhood, you have pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and... What are bootstraps exactly? Whispered Jane aloud. Shh, Tim told her. The commander continued. And one day in the future, I will send you to law school and you should become of my counsel to the Melanoff interest, Industries. A and B, the commander, or Commander Melanoff looked benignly at the twins. It was a Tuesday and Barnaby B was wearing the sweater. The overlong sleeves made it difficult to move checkers on the board, but the twins were accustomed to that obstacle. Tomorrow, Barnaby A would wear the sweater and the, hang the handicap would be reversed. What can I say about these two lovely boys? They remind me of... He sniffed and wiped his eyes. They were... They are at an age that... He dabbed again with his hanky. Well, I won't dwell on my own tragedy. I will only say that one day when you come of age, I will select names for you so that you will no longer be labeled inadequately by letters. I will. We have names. Shh, Tim told them. And dear Jane, the commander went on, such an adorable, self-assured little girl who, I'm hungry, Jane said loudly. Shh, Tim told her. The commander blew Jane a kiss. Finally, dear Nanny, Commander Melanoff fixed his eyes on Nanny with a lovesick gaze. She has made my house a home. Once it was filthy and now it is clean. Once it was cold and now it is warm. And once it was quiet and now it rejoices once. Commander, in, said Nanny in her no-nonsense voice. It's not just chicken. It's chicken breast cooked with lemon and caper sauce. And it's congealing and will soon be edible. Could we hurry this speech along? Commander chuckled. I, I am sorry. I do mean, I do meander conversationally. And all this speech making was just pre preliminary to my announcement. We'll go and eat our dinner right away. The announcement was simply that I have decided to do away with the stack. He gestured dramatically towards the immense pile of unnumbered letters and telegrams from Switzerland. After dinner, is there dessert, by the way? Nanny nodded. Creme caramel, she told him, if it hasn't burned to a crisp. After dessert, we will make a fire in the fireplace and we will burn the stack, little by little. Shall we open everything first? Asked Tim. It would take forever. No need, Commander Melanoff said. It is simply repetitious and terrible news. I stopped opening them after the first year and a half. We will burn them unopened. They began to move forward toward the dining room where the table was set for dinner, and Nanny picked up baby Ruth and carried her to her mahogany high chair. He's right, Jane said sweetly from her seat as she unfolded the linen napkin and laid it tidily on her lap of her ruffled frock. I opened a lot of them, and they were very boring. Did you, dear? Nanny placed a platter of chicken in front of Commander Melanoff. Were you practicing your reading like a good girl? Jane nodded. Yes, but it, it was just when you are coming to. When are you coming to get us? And when are you, where? When are you coming to get us over and over? Who was supposed to get who? Tim asked, and he began to pass the plates, each with its serving of chicken around. Whom, dear? Nanny reminded him. Commander Melanoff drizzled some of the lemon and caper sauce on his chicken. He tasted a bit and closed his eyes in delight. Mm, yummy, Nandy, as always. Who was supposed to come? Who was supposed to come get whom, Jane? Tim asked again, grammatically correct this time. Jane shrugged. I don't know. She never said. And then the next year she was angry and the letters kept saying, I never liked you anyway, you old goat, and you never picked up your dirty socks. Old goat is not a very pleasant phrase, Nanny told her. 
Let's never use it ourselves. Would you pass me some broccoli, eh? Commander Malinoff said politely. Help yourself first. She said worse than old goat, Jane pointed out. Who did, dear? Have you tried the broccoli? There's a smidgen of grated cheese on it, I think, Commander Milanoff said. I don't know who. She didn't ever say her name. Jane tasted the broccoli. But the last letter, the one that came last month, the one you put on the very tippity top of the stack, that one has a bad word in it. Commander Milanoff sighed. Those rescuers. It must have been come, become so frustrating for them over the years. I should have told them to stop digging long ago. I'm sorry they used bad words, Jane. Let's never think about it again. It wasn't a they, Jane told him. It was a she. May I say the bad word? Just once, very softly, Nanny gave her permission. A hush fell over the table as everyone waited for Jane, sweet Jane, to say a bad word. Jane scrunched up her face, remembering the lettering exactly, and she recited softly what she had read. You old fart! Your son is just like you. He never picks up after himself. My new husband and I have sent him off to make his own way in the world. Good riddance to you both. Jane glanced at Nanny. Riddance is a very bad word and I won't ever say it again. But no one heard Jane. They only heard the crashing sound of Commander Melanoff's chair tripping over as he leaped to his feet, dashed to the hall, and began pawing through the stack of mail. They could hear him sobbing loudly and repeating the words, My son! My son! Next, still sitting there, stunned by the turn of events, they heard a shrill ring of the doorbell. Nanny rose abruptly and ran forward, and all of the children followed except for baby Ruth, who, confined to her high chair, banged her spoon happily and chortled when the two cats jumped up on the table and began eating the chicken. Tell whoever it is to go away! sobbed Commander Melanoff, and he was kneeling on the floor surrounded by em envelopes, which he had been tearing open one at one as he wept. I can't face anyone any right now. Nanny opened the door politely, prepared to follow his instructions, but she stepped back, startled at the sight of a young boy, shivering, in the chilly evening. His hair was uncut, shaggy, and down to his shoulders. His face was dirty. He was thin and unkempt, wearing an old pair of short leather pants that were ragged and grease-stained. His knees exposed were scraped and bruised. His woolen socks were torn and sagging. Oh, it's Peter the goat herd, murmured Tim as in, in astonishment. Right out of Heidi. We can teach him to read and write, and then he'll smile and hug and say religious things. Shh! Nanny scolded him. She stood aside and allowed the bedraggled boy to enter. He looked around at each of them in turn with no sign of recognition. But his face changed when he caught sight of the heavy man in a tweed jacket who was kneeling and weeping on the hall floor. His eyes lit up. Papa, he said, I've come home. <laughs>